So welcome back to the second day of the workshop and we are still on sequence. And uh, if you remember yesterday, we had talked about what is bioinformatics. So bioinformatics is a subdiscipline of biology and computer science concerned with acquisition, storage, analysis, and dissemination of biological data. Most of this data is in the form of DNA, protein, and RNA sequences. Also in terms of protein structure data. Now, of course, there is a lot of metabolomics data and everything that is coming up. But the major share of data is in terms of the sequence. And, and then, of course, bioinformatics uses computer programs for a variety of applications, including determining the gene and protein functions, establishing evolutionary relationships, and predicting three-dimensional shapes of protein. Right. And yesterday, we had talked a bit about uh, the storage part, when the data is generated, where it is stored, and we talked of the two major repositories, NCBI, and then we also talked about where the genome information can be obtained, and we talked of UCC genome browsers, right? And this was the exercise that we did yesterday. Retrieve the sequence of PBR322 from NCBI portal, also enumerate the differences between the GenBank and the FASTA format. So we had seen two different formats of the, of the same data. One is what is known as the GenBank format, where you have the sequence, as well as you have the annotation. And then we saw the FASTA format, which was the standard sequence data format until the advent of next generation sequencing. So there are other formats that have now come up. And even other than FASTA and GenBank format for even for Sanger sequencing, there were some other formats available. I'll just so you, show you a glimpse. They're not so important, but you must know that there are other sequence formats as well, right? So, and then of course we had done experiment number two, where we had retrieved the sequence of human gap gene from the UCC genome browser. And we've also seen what are the various sequence formatting options available and what is the utility of those. So here we are. Uh, before moving on, uh, those of you who attended yesterday's session, you can take a screenshot of this and do this exercise for yourself so that you have some practice of how to look at the UCC genome browser, right? And then we move on. And uh, again, the faster format of the sequence, uh, you, now you know that this is basically a a uh, 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 sequence format where there is only sequence and there is just one extra line that is known as the def line which begins with the greater than sign and then you have the uh, generally the accession number for the sequence followed by a very short annotation of what the sequence represents right? the description line or def line is distinguished from the sequence data by a greater than sign at the beginning and there is no indexing there is no numbering of the sequence here right so this is your faster format data uh, and DNA, protein, and RNA sequence most commonly are found in the FASTA format. Then we have talked about the GenBank format, where you know you also have the annotation, and annotation is a description of the sequence, which includes a whole lot of fields, including your locus, definition, uh, accession number, then the references, the journal where it was published, and then of course followed by the sequence, right? And you begin with the sequence with a key term that is known as origin and you end the sequence with these double slashes here. So the point in the file where you have the origin, that is the beginning of the sequence, and then you have the double slashes, that is the end of the sequence, and in between, we have left indexing and nucleotides in six blocks of 10 each nucleotide. So in one line, there are 60 nucleotides. So this is your GenBank format, all of this we have done yesterday. Then there are other formats, like you have something called as EMBL format. So EMBL format is Again, it has a certain fields, and then, of course, you have the sequence. Here, in this case, uh, the sequence begins with the SQ line, and you have a one-line annotation of the sequence, followed by the next line where you have the sequence again in blocks of 10 nucleotides each and 60 nucleotides uh, per line, and the indexing on the right-hand side, right? This is 60, 120, 180. And uh, this EMBL format comes from the the laboratory from where it was in originally initiated. This is European Molecular Biology uh, Laboratory, right? And if you go to EMBL, uh, this is in Heidelberg in Germany. So this is me in EMBL. Uh, there is a building called Advanced Training Center, ATC, right? And this ATC building has been built on the shape of the DNA. So you can see the helix and you have the hydrogen bonds, one of the hydrogen bonds where I'm standing here. European Molecular Biology Laboratory, this is in Heidelberg, Germany one of the major centers of bioinformatics in the world today, right? So, so here you are, this is AMBL. The other format that is now becoming important progressively is what is known as the fast Q format. And this is the format that comes from the next generation sequencing machines. This is the format that comes not from the Sanger sequencing, but from the output of the next generation sequencing machines like Illumina, Ion Torrent, Nanopore, PacBio. So this is basically a single sequence is represented in 
four lines, right? There are uh, four lines per sequence. Uh, the first line basically represents the unique identifier for the sequence. So you have a very unique ID here. This includes a flow cell location and other details. Uh, this is basically unique again, the first line. If there are 4,000 sequences, there'll be 4,000 unique such lines that have unique codes here. Then you have the sequence in the second line. If you see here, this is your sequence, right? And the third line is basically uh, begins with the plus sign and, and is generally a repetition of the top uh, unique code on the first line. Uh, sometimes it may be just the plus line and nothing else, right? And then the last line is what is called as the quality score line. That is where it derives its, its name from. This is called the quality scores line. And therefore, the Q here stands for the quality. So fast Q is where the sequence is accompanied with the quality scores in the file itself. And each sequence is represented in four lines. These uh, quality scores are in ASCII characters, and they can be converted back into their numerical values. For example, here, uh, this one is basically the quality value for corresponding base on the top, quarthymen. And at this position in this sequence, the FRED quality score here is 29, right? So this is uh, a reverse square bracket represents 29 quality score. What is FRED score? FRED score is the probability of the uh, of the error at a given position in the sequence, right? And then let's move on to the basics again, because we'll do this uh, today. What we're going to do today is the restriction analysis of a given sequence. So here you are. I'm sure everybody knows this. Uh, you have your... Uh, DNA or nucleic acid is made up of a nucleic acid is made up of pentose sugar, uh, followed by an nitrogenous base at the first carbon, and at the fifth carbon you have the phosphate groups, which could be one, two, or three. The sugar, which is a pentose sugar, five carbon sugar. Uh, this could be ribose or deoxyribose. Ribose means there is an OH group at second carbon. Deoxyribose means there is a hydrogen at the second carbon, right? And then of course you have uh, the nitrogenous basis. The nitrogenous basis can be of two types. You could have purines, which are adenine and guanine, and you have pyrimidines, which can be cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Right? And uh, then beyond this, you have the phosphate groups, and phosphate groups can be uh, one, two, or three. Accordingly, you have uh, nucleotide triphosphate, nucleotide diphosphate, and monophosphate. Right? So attached uh, at the fifth carbon of the pentose sugar. So this is the basis of nucleic acids. And then, of course, if you talk of DNA, DNA has a level helix model. This model is proposed by Watson and Crick. Uh, I'm sure all of you know that. And the major features include the double-strandedness of the DNA. The two strands intertwine towards each other in the form of a helix. The direction of the helix is right-handed, uh, 2 nanometer in diameter, and around 10.5 base pairs per turn. Then the two strands are anti-parallel, and that is important. So this is because of the formation of phosphodiester bonds and the way they are formed. This re results in polarity of the of the strand, and the strand at one end is five prime, the other end it is three prime, and five prime end is marked by a phosphate group, and the three prime end is marked by an OH group. And the two strands have anti-parallel phosphate and OH groups. Right? The nucleotides on the same strand are bound by phosphodiester bonds. And nucleotides on the opposite strands are bound by the base complementarity rule, adenine pairing with thymine by hydrogen bonds, and guanine pairing with cytosine by triple hydrogen bonds. So this is double hydrogen bonds, this is triple hydrogen bonds, right? I'm sure all of you know that, just a revision of bit. So the nucleotides on opposite strands are linked to each other by hydrogen bonds, double hydrogen bonds, and triple hydrogen bonds. The base complement complementarity rule is absolutely clear. Adenine pairs with thymine and cytosine pairs with guanine. And therefore, if you have the sequence of only one strand, the sequence of the other strand can be derived, right? And the sequence of the other strand has to be read in the opposite direction because genes would always be on the, uh, in the direction of five prime to three prime. That's the only difference. So when you uh, do a complement and read it from the reverse end, you get a sequence of the other strand, right? And we'll come to it one more time because during sequence retrieval, the databases only have the top strand. And it has to be converted into, you know, if you if your gene is on the bottom strand, then you have to do a, a reverse complement to get the sequence. Everybody with me, class, you're following? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, so this, this much we had done yesterday also, right? So then we move on. And now we come to this idea of complement and reverse complement. So what happens is on the databases that you have, for example, UCC genome browser or for that even for that matter, NCBI, you have only one strand sequence. Why? Because you don't really want to waste your time storing the second sequence also, because it can be very easily derived computationally from the top strand. With one strand, you have no confusion of how to give the 
address of the sequence. So for example, here, this sequence is from 501 to 510, right? The, if this gene is in top strand, there is no problem. You can directly retrieve the sequence. You can say 510 to 5, 501 to 510 on chromosome, let's say one. So this is simple, but the gene could also be on the other strand, right? And in the other strand, the, the polarity is opposite. This is anti-parallel, the five prime end is here and the three prime end is here. And the gene is always from five prime to three prime. All biological uh, phenomena happen from five prime to three prime, whether it is replication, transcription or translation. So here now, let's say when you have your gene on this strand and you have the coordinates with reference to the top strand, what you have to do is first you have to generate the complement of the top sequence. And because the orientation is now anti-parallel, we have to do a reverse of that. So basically the term reverse complement uh, indicates the process that you have to follow. First you complement and read it from the reverse end to get the actual sequence. So that is what is a reverse complement. For genes located on the minus strand, you'll have to do a reverse complement while retrieving the sequence. For genes on the plus strand, it is not a problem. We can directly retrieve. And if you remember in the UCC genome browser, we had this option of doing a reverse complement. So one of these genes that I've given you for homework is on the reverse strand. And therefore, when you retrieve the sequence up there for that gene, you'll have to do a reverse complementation. So here we are. Uh, what do you do? So this is your DNA. There are two strands here. The two strands run anti-parallel to each other. The sequence of the second strand can be derived from the first strand using the base complementarity rule. Of course, A, A with T and G with C. Genes could be on either side. Uh, genes could be on either strands, on the plus strand or the minus strand. The sequence databases contain only the top or the plus strand sequence and annotation coordinates. Uh, so the coordinates are also based with respect to the top strand and gene location is given as reference to the plus strand only, top strand of the plus strand. If the gene is on the minus strand, then the sequence is complemented and read from the opposite direction. That is your reverse complementation since the gene starts from the five prime and ends in three prime end on the other strand, which is running anti-parallel to the top strand. So this is the whole idea about complement and reverse complement. Then we come to some of the very basic and fundamental discoveries in bat. Generating a recombinant DNA. So what is a recombinant DNA? When you can put DNA of two different sources together into a single molecule, that will be a recombinant DNA. The most common example would be to insert a piece of DNA into a plasmid, right? So what you want to do is you, because plasmid is a closed circular DNA, you need to open it up. And then, of course, you want to insert this uh, DNA of interest into the plasmid and create what is a recombinant DNA, which has the original plasmid and also the new insert stably integrated via phosphodiester bond into this, right? So in, in the process, what you're doing is you're first breaking up a phosphodiester bond. One phosphodiester bond meaning or one phosphodiester bond on the top strand, one on the bottom strand. So you're, breaking, you're basically opening your plasmid by creating a break in the double-stranded DNA by basically hydrolyzing two phosphodiester bonds, right? And this breaking of the phosphodiester bonds is, can be done using what is known as restriction endonucleases, right? I'm sure you would have read about them, and this is very fundamental to the current biotechnology that we do because this gave us a handle to manipulate the DNA. We could break up a DNA into, into you know, a certain number of pieces, or we could open a closed circular plasmid into an open a linear DNA to which we could add a new DNA and then again reseal and create a new circular DNA. So for example, here, you first use restriction endonucleases to to basically, you know, open the plasmid so that it can receive the insert. Then you use ligase to finally reseal your ends and make a, a final integrated single molecule of DNA that contains both your plasmid and the insert that you wanted here. So therefore, what you're doing here is you're breaking two phosphodiester bonds. And in a sense, you are now creating four new phosphodiester bonds, two here and two here, right? Uh, this uh, discovery of restriction in nucleases in bacteria was uh, uh, was one of the key points and key turning phases in the evolution of biotechnology. It gave you a handle to manipulate with the DNA, to play around with the DNA, create new combinations along with ligase. And that is where a recombinant DNA technology begins. And in recognition of this very basic and uh, fundamental discovery, Werner Arbor, Daniel Nathens, and Hamilton and Smith were given the Nobel Prize in 1978. And if you put it up here, uh, to create a recombinant DNA requires one, disruption of internal phosphodiester bonds by restriction endonuclease. 
that is where the restriction endonuclease become important and insertion of new dna and resealing by formation of phosphorus bonds by dna ligase so the two enzymes that are responsible for this is restriction enzymes and dna ligase that can result in formation of a recombinant dna right now if you see here uh the first what is effectively being broken when you when you talk of uh, uh, when you use a restriction enzyme is the phosphodiester bond this is the phosphodiester bond that we're talking of this is broken and uh, then of course uh, when you use ligase the phosphodiester bonds can be uh, can be restored so here you are this is a piece of dna you can basically use a restriction enzyme and hydrolyze this here now you have effectively two molecules and uh, then of course you could put up a piece of dna or if you don't put up a piece of dna you can also reseal them together provided you give dna ligase so this is the entire process that is happening here and uh, then now let me ask we'll leave the questions for now we'll come to it uh, but you can think over it so if a linear dna molecule has four restriction sites and all are digested how many fragments will be formed that is the question right if a linear dna it uh, has four restriction sites or let's say n restriction sites how many final number of fragments would it form in complete digestion and whether this is going to be this the same case with respect to circular dna or not so you can think over it and uh, let me know the answer we will come to it uh, in a later uh, slide again then so what is restriction endonuclease restriction endonuclease as the name indicates these are enzymes that can cut or diminish a dna endo means they cut internally not at the extremes so these are nucleases means they are cutting nucleic acids so these are restriction enzymes uh, produced by bacteria these are sequence specific endonucleases which means that they cut the dna only when a specific recognition sequence is present they don't cut at random uh, just any dna for for using restriction enzymes to cut a dna there has to be present a, a recognition sequence a specific succession of nucleotides must be present right and uh, so and what also happens is based on where the cut is made there are three different classes of restriction enzymes we specifically talk about uh, uh, restriction enzymes of class 2 which can cut within their recognition sequence right and let's say you have an enzyme x that recognizes the dna sequence of uh, 5 prime 80 80 3 prime so the sequence is 80 80 so if you have this dna uh, this would be cut because it has 80 80 intact so here is uh, when you use the enzyme x for uh, digesting the dna on the top it will be digested but this one here will not be digested because the recognition sequence is mutated here right so this is also the fundamental basis of restriction fragment length polymorphism we will not talk of that here but uh, just to give you an application side of it this is what was used for restriction fragment length polymorphism right i'm sure some of you would have heard the name then we move on and we talk of some real examples so here you are uh you have uh, some examples of recognition sequence of restriction enzymes and one specific particular thing that you can note here is that these sequences are palindromic which means when read on the top from 5 prime to 3 prime and read on the bottom from 5 prime to 3 prime they read exactly the same for example gga tcc and gga tcc right so this is what is a palindrome which can be read the same ways front and back can you give me an example of an english word a common english word that has a palindrome anyone common english words that are palindromes madam madam very good correct madam right <laughs> so very good so very prompt okay and then there are others and, and you can search for a lot of palindromes right and uh, what is also important is if you look at the y chromosome in humans there are large palindromes extremely large palindromes and it is still not clearly the significance of it is not very clearly understood even today but there are very large runs of palindromes on, uh, on the heterochromatic arm of y two third of y is heterochromatic doesn't code for most of the genes and um, but it is hugely heterochromatic likewise eco r1 and what you can also see here is that the recognition sequence length can be different right so this is 6 this is 6 eco r1 HA3 is 4 and then NOT1 is slightly longer. 8 base pair recognition sequence is required. Then length of the recognition sequence is variable, but it's specific for each enzyme. The recognition sequence is palindromic, that is, they read the same when read from 5 prime to 3 prime on the top or the bottom strand, as indicated by the red lines. 
Now, depending on the restriction that I'm used, uh, there are two types of cuts that can be made. One is where the top stand is cut at a separate position and the bottom stand is cut at a separate position. So when such a cut happens, you have what is known as overhangs or unpaired nucleotides at ends of DNA, right? This is what is known as a staggered cut. And then you could have a cut where, you know, the cut happens at the same position on the either nucleotide or on the either strand, in which case you leave what is known as a blunt cut. The blunt cut is more difficult to ligate because there is no natural affinity between the fibers to come together, right? So that is the, again, a uh, so, um, key point that if you want to do ligation, the preferable way of doing ligation is to ensure that you have a, uh, uh, what is known as a staggered cut, because then in that case, you would have a natural tendency for the strands to come together by hydrogen bond. And then the phosphodiester bond is, the ligase is only left there to stabilize these uh, further by creating a phosphodiester bond. So here you are, this is your BAMH1. The top strand cut happens here, the bottom strand cuts uh, happens here. So when you, after digestion, the strands are like this, and they have a natural tendency to come together because as you can see, there is complementarity between GC, TA, AT, and GC again, right? So they would have a natural tendency to come together. And now when you put up a ligase, they're already aligned to each other by hydrogen bonds. Only the ligase is going to create a phosphodiester bond, creating, increasing your efficiency of ligation. The same is not true for uh, the blunt end cutters, right? So here, if you digest, now they have no tendency, the two fragments will have no tendency to come together. And therefore, uh, the ligation efficiency in this case depends on by chance proximity of two fragments and whatever is close together would get ligated to each other. Right? So that is the whole idea here of ligation. Also, what happens is here in this case, you could have random ligation. There you are having end-to-end -end ligation of complementary strands. You could also ensure a directional cloning in case of, uh, in case of uh, a staggered end uh, digestion that you do. So you could digest one, uh, end of the plasmid with, let's say, you know, eco R1, the other end you can digest with HIN3. So the first end is compatible to eco R1 end, and the other end is compatible to HIN3 end. You could use the same enzymes to digest to insert. Now you'll have absolute directional cloning happening. So this is something that you can do with blunt end cuts. So here we are. Now the only question that is left is, what is the system meant for? So this system was kind of a immune response system in bacteria. To, to basically prevent in, uh, inversion or, or invasion from foreign DNA, right? And uh, this is a basic crude system of mechanism of uh, digesting the foreign DNA by identifying a specific motifs and then digesting it. And the more evolved and the more adaptive method is what is known as CRISPR-Cas method. I'm sure you would have heard about CRISPR-Cas. It is Nobel Prize in 2020, right? So I'm sure all of you know about CRISPR-Cas. It is a a highly adaptive memory-based system in bacteria. It is very surprising that bacteria could evolve such a simple strategy, which is a kind of an adaptive immune system in bacteria where it keeps a, where it keeps a memory of previous infections. And the moment a previous infection is repeated, it already has, you know, corresponding uh, tracer RNAs that can go bind and then uh, basically kill the foreign DNA. So this is uh, what it is. Now the question is, if the bacteria itself, uh, let's say we are talking of a four base pair recognition sequence. So there is every chance that this four base pair recognition sequence would also be present in bacterial own DNA. So how is bacterial own DNA not digested? That is because bacteria have what is known as a restriction modification system. What is a restriction modification system? In a restriction modification system, uh, every restriction enzyme has a cognate modification enzyme. And this modification enzyme goes and modifies the bacterial endogenous DNA, mostly by methylation. And once the DNA is methylated, it is not susceptible to digestion by endogenous restric restriction endonuclease. Everyone with me, class, you're following? Yes. Class, you're following? Okay. Yes, sir. So, and so these are your uh, methylation marks. Methylation happens most commonly on cytosin. And once... Uh, the cytosines are methylated, or in, in other cases, adenines are methylated, then this uh, methylated DNA that carries the signature sequence is not susceptible to digestion by eco R1. Likewise, uh, methylated DNA that carries these cytosine methylations, although it carries the recognition sequence, is not susceptible to digestion again, right? So this is what is uh, basically your restriction modification system. It is a basic system of uh, immune response in bacteria. 
trying to avert foreign DNA invasion, but on a most a more advanced and a more sophisticated and adaptive immune system is in the form of the CRISPR-Cas system, which is now being used very widely for targeted insertion of, of sequencing. And there is also a, a whole lot more that you can do. Again, you can go to my YouTube channel. The YouTube channel link is given here, youtube.com at the red classroom underscore weapon. I had given a lecture at Bhaskaracharya College uh, some two years ago on CRISPR-Cas, a very exhaustive lecture on how CRISPR-Cas works. And this lecture is titled CRISPR, Genome Editing and Beyond. So beyond genome editing, there are many other applications of CRISPR that are coming up, including, uh, I'm sure you would have heard about CRISPR-X or CRISPR diagnostics. So a lot of diagnostics is now being done by CRISPR. And if you look at the uh, coronavirus pandemic, we developed what is known as Peluda. Peluda is the endogenously developed CRISPR-based diagnostic kit for SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus-19 infections, right? So then we move on and we talk of uh, why are we talking about restriction mapping? Uh, so what we are going to do is that if you look at uh, uh, biology, there are several types of maps available, but the two common maps are what is known as the genetic map, which is based on the recombination frequency between genes, and that allows you to give a distance to the genes, which is not uh, very high resolution, but you can still tell there are three or four genes that you're talking about that are linked, that is basically close together on the genome. The recombination frequencies would be, uh, you know, less than 50 percent and that gives you a, a just uh, that gives you an idea of their genetic distance and that can be used again for assessing how close or how far they are from each other uh, on the other hand the restriction map gives you a physical distance physical distance in, in the sense that how far are two 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 respective genes with respect to number of base pairs in between right so that we talk of in terms of uh, the restriction enzymes for example here this is a 22 kilo base pair DNA, and we have a restriction enzyme at uh, position 5. We have a restriction enzyme at uh, 5 kb. We have another one at 6 kb. So we can say that restriction site A is 1 kb distance from restriction site C, right? And then we can also say that the first restriction, restriction site for A in this DNA is at 5 kb, and the next one is at 11 kb. So what it's saying is you are basically calculating the distance between two landmarks on your DNA in terms of exact base pairs, right? So this will be basically five and this is 11. So basically six KB distance between the next A cut site starting from this cut site here. So this is uh, what is known as restriction mapping. When you uh, when you take a DNA and mark all the restriction sites on that particular DNA, that is what is known as restriction mapping, right? And uh, this is one of the ways by which uh, when we're looking at the human genome and trying to arrange we use restriction fingerprints or you know the the pattern of fingerprints that are observed on on fragmentation with certain enzymes to identify the order of fragments in the dna uh, in the genome right and we'll talk of a bit more about it so now this if you see here when you mark on this all the restriction sites that it is carrying this becomes a restriction map right so this is your vector restriction map we are looking at three enzymes PST1, ECO R1, and HINT3. And when you mark all of these uh, positions on the on the plasmid DNA, that becomes a restriction map for these three enzymes, right? All distances are in kilobases here. And then, of course, uh, you know, if you look at how the questions are given, you are given basically a digestion pattern, and then you're asked to determine the restriction map. We will not go there. Again, you can go back to my YouTube to refer to it. What we will do is, We'll talk of general rules in restriction mapping, and then we'll use the Banfmatic experiment to identify the restriction sites on a given sequence. So ultimately, if you have the DNA sequence, because restriction uh, recognition sequences are small motifs of DNA that you can map onto your uh, larger DNA, you can identify which is the position where a restriction site is going to cut, and what is the fragment size you're going to obtain. Right. So that's the that's the idea of doing restriction mapping in silico. So here you are, uh, general rules of restriction mapping. So if you have a linear DNA, if you have one cut site, you'll have two fragments. If you have two cut sites, you'll have three fragments. If you have three cut sites, you'll have four fragments. So general rule is, so linear DNA and restriction sites will give you N plus one fragments. And if you talk of a circular DNA, if there is one cut site that is used only to open up the, uh, the plasmid DNA into a linear DNA. So one cut site leads in one frag results in one fragment, 
two cut sites result in two fragments, three cut sites result in three fragments, right? So here you are. So this is one fragment because it's just going to open up your DNA. Then these are two fragments, two cut sites, three fragments, three cut sites. So N restriction sites, N fragments. So as I asked you the question earlier, if you remember, uh, how many fragments will be obtained if there are four cut sites in a linear DNA? So the answer would be five. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the same for the circular DNA, whether it is similar or not. So in circular DNA, it is not the same. The first cut site is used only to open up the DNA and make it linear. And then, of course, the rest of the cut site result in as many fragments. So therefore, for circular DNA, N restriction sites result in N fragments. And uh, for linear DNA, N restriction sites result in N plus one fragments. Everyone with me, class? You're following? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So then we move on. And I hear a few voices this time. So linear DNA, two cut sites, three fragments. So now you know N plus one fragments, three fragments. Now the question is, uh, how many ways can they be arranged? right? And this, again, becomes a quite complex problem as the number of sites increase. And I'll show you how. So let's say there are three fragments. So then, of course, you can manually say how many uh, arrangements they can possibly make. So here you are, possible number of arrangements. If you are starting from 5 prime to 3 prime and the fragments are A, B, and C, you could arrange them as A, B, C. You could arrange them, arrange them as A, C, B, B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, and C, B, A. So for three fragments, you have uh, six uh, possible arrangements that are, that are available for you. So if there are n fragments, the formula for that is n factorial, right? So n factorial means or x factorial. So if there are the number of ways in which x fragments can be arranged as x factorial. So if there are three fragments, it will be three into two into one. If there are five fragments, five into four into three into two into one, which would be how much? Five factorial is quick calculate. Five into four, 20, 20 into three, 60, 16 to 2, 120, 120 okay. into 1, 120. Yes. So this is, uh, you know, and then of course I can show you that as the number of restriction sites increase linearly, the number of possible maps or possible arrangements of fragments increases mean, exponentially. And therefore you cannot really do this sum for more than let's say three or four sites. So here we are. This is for linear DNA. Likewise for circular DNA again, you could have just the same thing. So Let's say you have a question, if a linear DNA and circular DNA have the same number of restriction sites, which of the two will have higher number of possible arrangements? Anyone? Linear, linear DNA. Yes, linear DNA because the number of fragments is n plus 1, and then n plus 1 factorial will be more than n factorial, right? So that, that's right. So this is the answer to this. This will be linear. So if you, and if you just want to calculate it, number of restriction sites here I'm giving as n, then if there's a circular DNA, this is n factorial only, so 1, 2, uh, for 2, it is 2, for 3, it becomes 6, for, uh, you know, uh, number of restriction sites 4, it becomes 24, for 5, it becomes 120, for 6, it becomes 720, and correspondingly, if you have the linear DNA, the number of fragments, if the site is 1, the number of fragments is 2, so 2, and if you compare now, if the number of restriction sites is 6, for uh, possible arrangements for uh, circular DNA 720. And here it is basically uh, 7 factorial, that is 5040. So you see one increase in number of restriction site, and you have thousands of more possible maps coming up, right? And you could calculate this programmatically. So the complexity of the problem increases exponentially as the number of rest restriction sites increase linearly. So here is the Python program that I've written to calculate this. So of course, and if anybody who wants to learn coding, Again, I have uh, YouTube tracks on coding in Python and coding in R. And as some, somebody who's doing biotechnology today or biology today, I must emphasize that, you know, since we are, since the nature of science that we do is changing and it is fast becoming a data driven science, it is important that you know a bit of coding because most of the analysis is now done through codes again, right? That you, can, you could have a web interface, but web interface is going to take much longer and you will not have the options of tweaking your algorithm. In case you know coding, you could basically take the code, run it without the, uh, you know, not on the internet, but at your local system, uh, at your local high-end machine. And that gives you the power of quickness and also the power to, you know, change the options. So this is important that uh, anybody who's doing biotechnology today 
should be good at biostatistics because uh, a lot of data is now to be first, you know, cleaned with respect to what is the kind of signal you get. And then, of course, at every step, you have to apply biostatistics to be ensure that the high throughput data that you're taking is of good quality and you're not taking uh, garbage, right? Because with computational uh, programming, it is always said garbage and garbage out. So here you are, this is your program. And if you look at the output here, this is the output, right? So sites, uh, maps for circular and maps for linear, right? So as you see, it is only 20 and you can see the whole order of magnitude of possible combinations of fragments that are there, right? So this is the complexity that you have. So beyond four or five, you cannot really, you know, do this exercise. So this is uh, something that, um, this is also what is known as NP incomplete problem, a certain category of problems that are even difficult for computer to, to compute, right, uh, beyond a point. So I've already told you, you had the Nobel Prize in Physiology for Medicine in 1978, Werner Arbor, Daniel and Hamilton was Smith were awarded Nobel Prize for the discovery of uh, restriction enzymes. And uh, the common questions that you get across your net and set and other examinations with respect to restriction mapping is two types. One is the common basic uh, common sense problems of how many fragments you get. The other is you are given a digestion pattern. So here is uh, three enzymes you're looking at, ABC, you are given a digestion pattern and you're asked to cal make a restriction map that satisfies all these conditions, right? So this is not something that we're going to address today, but uh, you can have a look at my YouTube uh, uh, channel. This is called recombinant. I mean, the channel is uh, youtube.com uh, classroom underscore weapon. And there you have a track called recombinant DNA technology where I discuss most of these things. Also for the bioinformatics bio experiments, some of you have joined only today, were not there yesterday. They can also go back and check the bioinformatics experiment up there, right? So some of these are already loaded there. So coming back today now, what do we do today as an exercise? So as an exercise, what we do today is we look at the sequence of PBR322 again. So we would uh, we draw its sequence and uh, basically draw its restriction map. We will also deduce the size of fragments obtained on digestion with EcoR1 and EcoR5, right? So we are also looking at uh, uh, how to, you know, do a custom digestion of a, of a DNA sequence and look at the possible number of fragments that you're, you're expected to obtain and the possible pattern or size of fragments you're expected to obtain when you digest with the two enzymes, EcoR1 and EcoR5, right? So where we'll go, we'll go to NCBI, we'll go to sequence format, and we'll go to NAB cutter, and NAB cutter is the tool we're going to use for this today, right? So first, of course, we go to NCBI to, to pull out the sequence, so to go. Yesterday also I told you, this is one of the biggest repositories of biomedical information, and we go to, because we want to pull out the nucleotide sequence of a plasmid, we can go to the nucleotide database here. Of all the databases available, we'll go to nucleotide. And in nucleotide, we give our search term that is PBR322. So we say PBR322. And you press enter here. And there you go, right? So you are uh, now, if you look at the second hit here, that is cloning vector PBR322 complete sequence. This is what we want. So we can click on this. And we are into PBR322, right? And by default, it will load the GenBank format, which will be basically a lot of details and annotation for the sequence, followed by the sequence at the end with left indexing. The numbering is at the left, and uh, there are 60 nucleotides in one lane in blocks of 10 inch. So this is something that you've already seen. So what we'll do is we'll shift to the faster format, and to shift to faster format, we can click on faster, right? So when you click on faster, you're now in the faster format. Uh, since the sequence is small, you can do a direct, uh, you know, selection of sequence and copy it and directly paste onto the next tool. Otherwise, if the sequences are too big, what you can do is you can see, say send to and you can say send to file and you can select the format as faster. You can say create file. When you say create file, your sequence will be created here. And let's say this is sequence underscore. PBR322, and you press enter, right? So now my sequence is there in the file, and also I have it here. I'm also selecting it from here directly, right? So here you are, you can select this. Now we move on to the tool that is going to help us in analysis of 
restriction digestion. So we go to what is known as NEB cutter. NEB C U T T E R. As the name indicates, NEB cutter is basically cutter means it is going to cut your DNA. NEB stands for New England Biolabs, the company that prepares most of the restriction enzymes, right? So this is the interface of the tool here. NEB cutter, if you see, you have uh, on top New England Biolabs, and then of course you could sign in or sign up if you want to, right? Uh, enter a DNA sequence or select from other options to identify cut sites. Once you submit a sequence, you may choose to customize your digest, right? So once you submit your sequence, there will be option to customizing your digest. Now, here is the format that it can take. It can take a text format, so you can just uh, paste your sequence here. So like I'm doing here, right? So this is your, I'm just checking if this is a PBR322 sequence or not. So this is what it is, PBR322 sequence in faster format. Faster format is the standard format. Most tools will take faster format as such. So it should not be a problem. You could also upload a file in case, because remember we have saved it in a file, so we could do browse file. And we could now select from the desktop. Uh, I've select, uh, saved it on the desktop. So you can go to the desktop. And in desktop, if you see, you have this S, I think. So see, SEQ PBR322. Since I've already pasted, I will not select this option. But you could do this as well, right? So you can load it from here. If you have the GenBank ID, you could use that. It also has some of the vector sequences already inbuilt into the tool. So you could have also chosen from here. You could choose your uh, whichever plasma you want to. For example, you could go to here and you could have a PBR3. This is all alphabetically arranged so that you can select easily. So you could have selected it from here as well. So this is your PBR322, right? And then, of course, there are viral and fast DNA. And uh, then again, that is a selection process. You could select whichever particular virus that is available here you want to check for, right? Now, this is uh, what will, uh, you know, skip because we don't have to. We have given the sequence here. So we come back to our text option. Second, now we have uh, uh, the set references. And here we know that this is the plasmid sequence. So it will be circular in form. So therefore, you are given a circular. You select for circular. You have an optional uh, name for the project. So we can say, uh, let's say we say NIT underscore. SEQ1, right? Once you submit this now, what you'll get is a restriction map for the sequence. And this will be all enzymes cutting once into the sequence. If you see here, you have the restriction map of the sequence with respect to, you know, the enzymes that cut here. Uh, for example, you could, you know, this is equal R5 here, right? Cuts at 187 and as blunt. So it gives you also the recognition sequence when you mouse over the enzyme name. It will give you the recognition sequence. It will also give you where it is cutting on the sequence, the starting uh, uh, sequence number, right? So that is basically what you have as your start. And this is the, the origin is taken to be here. This is the zero point. And then, of course, uh, all numbering is from this and until 4361 base pairs here. So the last nucleotide here will be 4361. And then the remaining ones here. So this is uh, what you have as your uh, default view of the restriction map of uh, PBR322. Let's say now you want to look at all uh, enzymes that cut twice into your sequence. So you have a specific requirement of identifying enzymes that cut twice into the sequence. So you could check this box called two cutters. It will now map you all enzymes that cut twice into this uh, into the sequence. For example, here you can see you have uh, BAN2. And if you mouse over BN2, it says G, R, G, C, Y, C. Now, what is R and Y? R and Y, basically, R represents all any of the two purines, and Y represents any of the two pyrimidines. So there is a, uh, you know, a, a, a nomenclature for these nucleotides where there are options of any of the two or any of the four. If it is any of the four, then the nomenclature is capital N. I'll show you some of, some of those sites as well. So let me just take you through the PowerPoint again. So here you are, uh, if you look at the nomenclature of the residues, guanine is G, adenine is A, thymine is T, cytosine is C. Any purine, guanine or adenine, represented by capital R here, thymine or cytosine represented by capital Y here, right? What is H? H is something that is not G. It can be any of the remaining three nucleotides, but not guanine. 
So for such nomenclatures, you use the letter next to the actual nucleotide. So not G, anything but G, you use a letter H. Likewise, uh, you know, anything but adenine, so not A, which means, you know, anything but adenine, so G, T, or C, right? So therefore, the letter next to A has been used, right? Not T, so therefore, what you use is a V. Likewise, uh, G, A, or T, so which is basically equivalent to saying not cytosine, so for that, you use D. So the letter next to the actual uh, letter can be used for uh, for basically, you know, using, excluding that particular nucleotide. So for G, uh, H, for A, V, for, for T, V, and for C, you use D, right? Everybody with me, class? Yes, sir. So these are special nucleotides and nomenclature. I've given you the reference also. This is coming from European Journal of Biochemistry, 1985 paper in Feds. And uh, this is the standard format that we follow. Uh, as we talk about uh, nucleotide. So here we are, class. We are looking at now the restriction map, and we're looking specifically at restriction enzymes that cut twice into the uh, into the sequence, right? So here you are. You have this band two, both of them are together. Then BTG one, and if you see here, that the other BTG one site is here, right? So this one here, if you see, it says CCRY, which means at the third position it could be any furin. And at the fourth position, it could be any pyrimidine. But at the start and end, it has to have a CC and GG. And this is going to cut at 1447. And this leaves a four nucleotide, five prime over high, right? Then let's look for a blunt enzyme here. So for example, here, this one. And you can see there is a whole lot of ends here. Ends means any nucleotide, right? Any nucleotide is fine. So GAA, there are four ends followed by TTC. And this basically results in a blunt end cut, right? So this is uh, what you have here. Likewise, you could look at the three cutters. So when you click on three cutters, you'll have enzymes that cut thrice into the sequence. For example, here, you could have enemy uh, one here, then enemy A3. This is one site. This is the second site. And then where is the third site here? This one is the third site. Can you see that class, everybody? Yeah, and again, this is... Uh, uh, Staggered end cutter leaves a two nucleotide three prime extension or three prime over high, right? Now coming to the question that has been asked. The question is, uh, what is the fragment that you're going to get when you digest it with your specific enzyme? So if you see here, you have this option of custom digest, right? So custom digest is where you can select from a list of enzymes, the enzymes of your choice. For example, here in this case, our question is that we want to look at what is the digestion pattern when you digest this uh, PBR322 with EcoR1 and EcoR5, right? So we come back here, and when you click on custom digest, it gives you a whole list of enzymes from which you can select the ones that you want here, right? And this also gives you the recognition sequence along with the position of the cut site on the top strand and on the bottom strand. So this is on the top strand, this is the bottom strand, which means it's going to uh, leave a staggered cut with a four base pair overhang, four base overhang, right? We are talking of uh, the first enzyme, A82. Now let's talk of eco R1 and eco R5. So these are enzymes arranged in alphabetical order. So you can easily select for the enzyme that you're looking for. Uh, you could go to eco R1 EC, right? Eco R1 is here. You can click here, right? And then, of course, you have also eco R5 next to it. You can click here. So, and if you see here, there are eco R1 and eco R1 HF. HF means high fidelity. Means this enzyme will have very high efficiency and very high accuracy of cutting into the DNA. The cost will be a little higher, but it will be extremely uh, correct at the cut. Likewise, eco R5 uh, normal and eco R5 high fidelity. So, basically, again, high fidelity means when you're doing a very high quality experiments where you want to ensure that your restriction digestion happens exactly at the position you want and not anywhere else, uh, not even slightest of errors, then you use a high fidelity enzyme, right? And likewise for TAC polymerase, you have normal TAC polymerase that we use every day in our lab preparations, but sometimes we need uh, absolute assurance that there is no, you know, uh, there is no uh, uh, error in, uh, in during the amplification process. So then you can use high fidelity tag, right? You could use PFU, you could use vent, another type of high, high fidelity tag. 
So this is basically high fidelity. Basically, the function is the same, just that this is more reliable as compared to the previous one. So here you are. You can now click on digest. If you scroll down also, you'll have a digest button. No, you have digest button on the top. So you could click on digest now, and that would give you now the uh, uh, the digestion pattern. So here you are, you click on digest. And now you see your map again, and you can see you have equal five cut site at uh, position 187, and you have equal and cut site at position 4359, right? So you will get effectively how many fragments are you going to get here, class? Two. Two, yeah, circular DNA with two cut sites will give you two fragments. And it is very clear, one is this fragment here, the other is the remaining bigger fragment here, right? And the size of the fragment, if you see here, the plasmid is 436 on base pairs, and this one is cutting at, if you look at, this is cutting at 4359, which means two nucleotides from here and another 187 from here. So there should be 189 bases, and the remaining would be from here, 189, uh, two until like four, three, five, nine. So that would be the other size, right? So you could basically, you know, uh, look at this here. And if you want to have a direct observation in terms of graphical view, and you want to see what are the fragments that you're going to obtain, how the fragments are going to resolve on gel, there is an option for viewing on gel. So you can click on gel, and you can see very clearly uh, if you run the ladder alongside, these are the two fragments are going to obtain because the fragment sizes are vastly different. You'll have a large gap between them when you resolve it on agarose gel. And these are the fragments here. You have one 189 base pair fragment. The other one that is 4172 base pair fragment, right? So this is uh, what you, you can do. And what is the advantage of this? You can predict the size of fragments you want, you are going to obtain when you do your, let's say, a southern hybridization. If you're using a probe and you want to know what will be the uh, size of the fragment that I'll be able to see on the gel when I use my southern hybridization. So for that, you could use these uh, uh, in silico methods of first checking where is the recognition sequence. You could also decide which which uh, enzyme would give you a better uh, visual display of your uh, of your uh, you know sequence of interest when you're designing your, designing your southern hybridization or your northern hybridization and so on and so forth. Or, or you're doing your RFLP experiments. So which one would be better? Of course, now these experiments are becoming a bit of a thing of the past because we are moving into next generation sequencing. And slowly, uh, it is now being said that sequencing is the new microscope and everything and every analysis begins at the uh, at the sequence level now. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sequencing is becoming the new microscope. The older methods of northern southern hybridization and things are these things are becoming things of the past because for everything now a sequencing is available and sequencing has got so cheap that uh, you know sometimes it is a lot easier to get the things sequenced as compared to getting them confirmed via northern and southern and of also what is important is that today you know for example if you're doing DNA fingerprinting there was a time you used to southern probes or southern probes, but now you can do it with PCR, right? So you could just amplify the local region and then do a digestion to basically see what is the impact that you're going to have. Uh, so in that sense, this uh, restriction digestion uh, exercise would tell you the number of fragments, the size of fragments obtained, provided there is no mutation. Uh, also, what is important is let's say one of these sites gets mutated. So now you know when you digest it, uh, let's say one of these sites, eco or one site is mutated, right? So only site that is going to be digested is eco R5, and then the fragment obtained will be of what size class? If one of the two sites is mutated, what is the fragment size you're going to obtain? Anyone? The whole length of the... The whole length, four, three, six on base pairs. Only thing is it will open up, right? Because there is one site that, that the DNA is able to digest. So it opens up and gives you one single fragment of 4361 base pairs, right? So that is the whole idea. So you could predict your fragment sizes. You could also, uh, you know, and um, then of course you could do your SNP analysis, right? So the restriction fragment length polymorphism, if you have read about. So this is all based on the idea of, uh, you know, digesting uh, the DNA at a position where the restriction site for a particular enzyme is polymorphic. So some of the individuals have that restriction uh, recognition sequence. Other individuals do not have that recognition sequence because one of the nucleotides is mutated. So therefore, that digestion happens in some individuals. In others, it will not happen based on the DNA composition and based on the water inherited from the mother and the father. 
and that could result in your restriction fingerprint and that could also be your <coughs> dna fingerprint <coughs> by the way there is uh, one interesting story on dna fingerprinting on my youtube channel again this is basically the first criminal case where dna fingerprinting was used and this one is especially in hindi because uh, i wanted it for wider audience so uh, recently i've added this and here uh, the story is interesting because despite the dna fingerprinting the perpetrator perpetrator of two rapes escaped and almost escaped until one day somebody just you know he got drunk and he revealed something that led him to uh, led police to him and finally he was caught and uh, so now that finishes our experiment for today